Would you pray with me? O oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Lynn manuel Miranda's smash Broadway musical, Hamilton, based on a biography of Alexander Hamilton by Ron Chernow, recounts the early history of the United States through the lens of its main character and his nemesis, Aaron Burr. But one minor character has become a fan favorite, the role of King George III of England. In three short appearances, King George addresses the colonies like a jilted lover addressing his ex. You'll be back, he croons. And he tells them what he's prepared to do as king to remind them that they belong to him. I will send a fully armed battalion. I will kill your friends and family to remind you of my love. Da, 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 da. The relationship between kings and their subjects are complicated. In a sense, this is the message that the prophet Samuel delivers to the people in the verses we read today from 1 Samuel 8. If you aren't reading along with us in the story, let me give you just a bit of context. At the end of the book of Judges, the separate tribes of Israel were in chaos, warring with their neighbors and sometimes with each other. As a loose federation of tribes, they were being overwhelmed by more powerful forces around them, especially the mighty Philistines. Internally, their religious leadership was in crisis. Samuel, their trusted prophet, seer and priest was aging and his sons whom he appointed to succeed him were corrupt and unjust the israelites looked around at their neighbors who were faring way better than they were and they had kings so the israelites concluded that what they needed was a king give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have they demanded of Samuel. Samuel and God knew this was a bad idea. And so it seems did the author of First Samuel, because these stories of Israel's history were compiled centuries after the events they described, during a time of exile when the failure of Israel's kings was painfully obvious. The overarching theme of the entire Deuteronomistic history, from Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and Kings, is that the people of God repeatedly choose to put their trust in someone or something other than God. And ultimately, those choices bring them to ruin. So Samuel was displeased with the people's request, Samuel tells us, and he prayed to God, probably hoping God would side with him and deny the people's request. They aren't rejecting you, Samuel. They're rejecting me, God replied. I brought them out of Egypt and I told them they would never need another Pharaoh, another ruler, another king besides me, but they just can't seem to listen. So fine, I'll give them a king. But first, Samuel, you tell them what kings are like. Samuel did as God commanded, and if the scene were in a movie, it would almost be comical. You can imagine the furrow in Samuel's brow as he warned them. You say you want a king? A king will take your sons and daughters into his service. He'll take your land, your servants, your livestock. A king will take it all. But he'll fight our battles for us, right? Sounds good, the people replied. Our imaginary scene closes with an unseen narrator 
who says softly, be careful what you ask for. You just might get it. As we read on in 1 Samuel, we learn that Samuel did as he was told. He found an anointed Saul, whose main qualifications, according to the Bible, and I'm not making this up, were that he was tall and handsome. Saul won some victories that gave people confidence in his leadership, but ultimately he ignored God's commands and he was replaced. As we will see in coming weeks, some other kings fare better, but even the good ones like David and Solomon prove to be fallible, flawed humans. And none of them brought Israel the stability and security for which they so desperately longed. As Americans, we might not immediately identify with the Israelites' desire for a king, our history, unlike Israel's, is one of rejecting the rule of a king and fighting for the right to govern ourselves. If you ask us about kings, we're as likely to mention a hockey team from L.A. or a singer named Elvis as we are a ruling monarch. Yet as Christians, we are part of a faith tradition that uses the language of kings and kingdoms to describe God's realm and our place in it. Jesus taught us to pray, thy kingdom come, and use parables to describe what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, was like. All that kingly talk made the Roman Empire suspicious of Jesus, and the charge that brought Jesus before Pilate and eventually got him killed was being declared king of the Jews. In response to Pilate's questioning, Jesus never called himself by that title. But the kingdom that he proclaimed, the kingdom of God, stood in stark contrast to the Roman Empire. His was an upside-down kingdom where the first were last and the last were first, where weakness was power, where outcasts were welcomed, and where love, not power, ruled. Jesus might not have called himself a king, but others have used that title for him. We sing hymns like, O worship the king, and lead on, O king eternal. In Handel's Messiah, we proclaim Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. And on the last Sunday of the Christian year, the Sunday before Advent, we celebrate something called Christ the King Sunday, also known as Reign of Christ Sunday. Unlike other celebrations in the Christian year, Christ the King Sunday is not an ancient tradition. In fact, it's not even 100 years old. Pope Pius XI instituted Christ the King Sunday in 1925. After the devastation and destruction of the First World War, people were searching for what they could trust, where to place their allegiance, and how to restore a sense of security. In that context, charismatic leaders were emerging with the promise of becoming saviors, leaders like Adolf Hitler and Benito Mussolini. With atheism, communism, and totalitarianism on the rise, the people were reminded by the Pope that Christ, not Hitler or Mussolini, is the one in whom they should trust, the one to whom they should offer their allegiance, the one in whom they find their security. People must look for the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ, the Pope wrote. Christ is our King. The challenge that Pope Pius saw in 1925 is a challenge that has confronted people of faith in all ages, and in a way, the same challenge the Israelites were facing in the time of Samuel. In what or in whom do we put our trust? 
Where do we place our allegiance? What is the source of our security? We might not ask for a king like the Israelites, but we can identify with their very human longing for safety and stability, their desire to have someone fight their battles. God promised to be their sovereign, but it's hard to blame them for wanting a sovereign they could see. As humans, we need systems of government to help us manage our life together. But as one commentator points out, the central theme of this passage from 1 Samuel is not about the pros and cons of various forms of government. It's a reminder that no form of government is perfect, that human leaders, no matter how wise, have their limitations, and more importantly, that as people of faith, our primary allegiance is not to a person, a party, or a platform. Our allegiance is to God and God alone. In this season when our politics makes us feel so divided, we Christians might pause to remember that we all march under the same cross-shaped banner of one we dare to call king. It's an uncomfortable metaphor in some ways, especially given that hierarchical, top-down, exploitive nature of kings that Samuel describes so eloquently. For that reason, and many others, some Christians have added the language of kingdom, leaving out that G, which shifts the focus to our shared identity as kinfolk, children of God. It reminds us of Christ's call that we love one another and we love our neighbors as ourselves. For me, these terms aren't either or, they're both and. Each of them helps us understand our relationships with God and with each other. So today, as we think about Israel's history with human kings and the image of Christ as king, we might reflect on what it means for us to be subjects of God's kingdom. Samuel warned the Israelites about the costs of a king. And if we are serious about following Jesus, we should be warned as well. As our king, Jesus does not take from us like the kings of the world, but he does call on us to surrender our all to him, to surrender our fears, our attachments, our comforts, our opinions, anything that keeps us from following him more closely. If we choose to proclaim Christ as king, it will cost us, but it will also give us something that no earthly ruler can give, a peace that passes all understanding, a hope that is eternal, and a love that will not let us go. Amen.